Chapter 11. Megaton. I Island Central Tower Second Floor. Toshi Noriyagi was gritting his teeth so hard he swore they would break at any second. He was quite possibly in the worst situation imaginable, he was tied up by advanced security bindings restricting his movement, the Steel Sabres had allied with the League of Villains, they had full control of I Island and he was rapidly bleeding through the remaining embers of one for all. It was a scenario out of his worst nightmares. If he reverted to his regular form, then the secret would be out, the people would lose hope and all for one would achieve victory. He was struggling as hard as he could to maintain his All Might form but he was steadily losing power and if he kept it up any longer, he would revert to his normal form. Looking at the scores of frightened party guests and tied up pro heroes, Yagi hoped that no harm would befall them and his friend David Shields, who sat next to Melissa and his aide, Samuel Abraham. Seeing Melissa scared out of her mind as she held onto her father filled him with the resolve to bust out of his restraints but he couldn't due to how strong they were. The security systems were literally on par with Tartarus prison, he couldn't move an inch. His eyes drifted over to Nine, ignoring the pompous speech the other masked villain was loudly giving out. He never thought he would get to see the leader of the infamous Steel Sabres in a place like this. His blood boiled as he observed the mercenary leader staring stoically ahead without a hint of emotion. Yagi was no stranger to the war crimes the Steel Sabres committed and he made it his oath to bring them to justice. And now here he was, captured by them, and could only guess what they were after. Was it I Island's technology or him? And what about young Midoriya? Was he able to get away? He prayed that his pupil was safe and wouldn't do anything rash. These men would not exercise restraint just because he was a child. God help these mercenaries if any harm befell Midoriya. Nine's internal musings easily drowned out Wolfram's spiel as he watched his soldiers, as well as some of Wolfram's own, guard the ballroom. Though it was a tad too early to celebrate, he couldn't help but feel good about his progress so far. To think that the Sabres would get the opportunity to raid the most heavily guarded artificial island in the world was a one in a billion chance. To have it completely under their control was a monumental achievement. The sheer wealth of technology I Island had to offer would strengthen the military might of the Sabres a hundredfold. They would be unstoppable and he had the League of Villains and David Shield's short-sighted idiocy to thank for it. He could feel All Might's scathing glare on him but he cared not. Nine had always wanted to bring down the symbol of peace himself and soon, he would get his chance. All for one was going to have to wait in line because he certainly wasn't going to pass this opportunity up. Just a few more hours and the Sabres would have their cut of the tech and all of the hostages would be dead long before the heroes ever tried to set foot here. Nine's wrist communicator started beeping and he answered. Report. Commander, this is Lieutenant Chimera. We can't raise Theta Team 12. Nine raised an eyebrow. What do you mean? We've been trying to contact them for the last several minutes but we haven't heard anything back from them. Radio trouble. Our radios are fine but they're not responding. Hmm. I'm going to the main server room and see if mummy can boost the signal. I don't like being put behind schedule. Roger. Nine went for the door and exited the ballroom, leaving Wolfram, his men, and well as his soldiers to guard the heroes and guests. He turned right and walked down the hall until he heard something behind him. He turned his head a little to see four security drones position themselves on each side of the door. Figuring out that Mummy must have sent extra security to the ballroom, Nine resumed his march to the main server room. Completely unaware that the drones were watching his every move. I Island Service Bridge. The Doomslayer pulled out the bloody knife from the throat of a saber he just killed and chucked him into the water below. His stealthy approach to the direction Vega was pointing him to was proving to be easier than he thought. With Vega in control of the cameras and security drones, it made slipping past the numerous patrols dotted around I Island a breeze. Aside from the one saber, he put down who almost spotted him purely by accident, he had already made it this far into their perimeter. But why was Vega leading him to the left quadrant of this island? Spotting a large patrol with an APC in their formation coming up ahead, the slayer leaped off the bridge, caught a steel girder underneath, and swung himself out of view. Landing on the steel beams under the bridge, the slayer looked up and saw dust raining down above him as he heard the sounds of heavy tires and marching feet rumble across the bridge. 
The Doomslayer looked down and noticed the recently dead body of the mercenary he just killed float under the bridge. He heard them cross the bridge and continue on their way, leaving him to assume they didn't spot the body. Slash the area you are heading towards functions as the factory section for Eye Island. This is where they manufacture support items as well as their more secretive projects. This area holds a submarine bay located in the very center of this district and is your primary target. The submarine bay is mostly used for transportation and delivery of materials for their projects, the Sabres are using their nuclear submarine to offload the island's technology and use them for their purposes. It is imperative that we do not let the Sabres gain possession of Eye Island's inventions, forward slash. The Doomslayer nodded. There was no telling what would happen if the Sabres got their hands on that tech. Slash a majority of the Sabres are located around this sector of Eye Island and the submarine bay. The factories around the bay are filled with highly volatile materials, I calculated that the detonation of the submarine's nuclear core will create a chain reaction that will destroy this entire quadrant and eliminate half of the Sabres organization, forward slash. The Slayer was conflicted about that strategy. While it was the perfect way to decimate their army, it left him concerned that he'd be spreading radiation across the island. He still had hostages to save. Slash your Praetor suit can absorb other energies besides Argent energy. I will reconfigure your suit to absorb any radioactivity produced from the detonation of the explosion and extinguish it to prevent widespread contamination and radiation poisoning. You have my assurance that you and the hostages will not be harmed. On a related note, the Sabres will be demoralized and disoriented once you carry this out, I have calculated that this will buy the hostages some time as the Sabres will be solely focused on terminating you, forward slash. His fingers twitched with anticipation, the Doomslayer jumped across the steel beams and grabbed onto a girder, swinging himself back up onto the bridge and making his way into the factory area. Eye Island Central Tower Main Server Room Nine entered the room with his hands clasped behind his back, eyeing Mummy as he worked at the console. Slice and Chimera were there as well while Wolfram's subordinates were off combing the rest of the tower for any stragglers. Any word from them? Nine asked. Nothing, sir. They've gotten completely dark. Mummy informed. Nine narrowed his eyes. Theta Squad 12 better have a good reason for this. Beta Squad 2 over at the subpan were going to broadcast a live video through most of the mainland as an intimidation tactic to steer any hero away from Eye Island. But that was to stall for more time while he and the rest of the Sabres finished up their operations here and he needed Theta Squad to relay the layout for the subway tunnels after their escape. They weren't responding and it started to irk 9. If I may make a suggestion, we could see if the terminals are still operational and then activate the live feed transmission to see what's going on. Slice offered. Nine nodded to Mummy and the bandage wrapped quirk user began typing on his keyboard, accessing Theta Squad's terminal as he did. Mummy turned on the video feed on the main monitor but it only showed darkness. They could make out some shapes but it was still too dark to see. Let me turn on the night vision function. Mummy said as he typed in a command. The screen was bathed in a green hue and. Everyone recoiled. What? Nine whispered to himself. The screen showed an abandoned subway station, completely bathed in red. The bodies of Theta Squad 12 were in various states of total mutilation, ripped in half, crushed, blown apart, shot up, or reduced to a pile of body parts. Nine and his lieutenants were no strangers to such imagery but this was on a completely different level. Nine's communicator started beeping again. Commander, we've lost all radio contact with IOTA Squad 4 over by the airport. We can't raise anybody there. Nine was about to demand what went wrong until a wave of realization washed over him. He clenched his teeth as he turned to Chimera and Slice. We've been compromised. Eye Island Factory District. Atop the roof of the submarine pen, three sabers were on patrol. They kept their eyes peeled for any intruders and their fingers on the trigger of their assault rifles. One saber ventured near the edge of the roof to look over the district. Shame he never bothered to look down when the Doomslayer, climbing up a roof ladder, thrust a knife right into his throat and was promptly hurled downward into a garbage bin below. The other two sabers heard the noise and turned around just in time to see a flurry of combat knives lodge themselves into each of their faces, courtesy of the Slayer's inhuman reflexes. 
The slayer climbed up onto the roof as the body slumped over onto the ground. Cautiously moving over to a large skylight, he observed the Steel Saber's massive submarine, painted completely black with a red streak going across the middle. It was the largest sub he'd ever seen and it was probably big enough to fit the whole organization. Again, Vega wasn't exaggerating when he said the Sabres brought every man in their little thrill-kill club here. He noticed a multitude of Sabres packaging dozens of inventions and support items into wooden crates, ready to load them onto the sub. Slash update, Nine and his lieutenants are on to us. They have discovered you killed the squad in the subways and they have noticed that their men over at the airport are not reporting in. I will stall them but it is now or never, Slayer. Moving away from the skylight, the Slayer tightened his fists and began to head towards a roof hatch. He was starting to get tired of sneaking around. I Island Central Tower Main Server Room. But how? This entire operation had been flawless. Slice reasoned in denial. So far. It's been successful so far. Chimera corrected her with an irritated tone. What I want to know is what the fuck killed Theta Squad. It couldn't have been a hero. It had to have been someone who was on to our operations but who? Mummy wondered as he tried to make sense of what happened. We can worry about who killed them later. Mummy, sound the alarm to all our forces. Nine ordered. Mummy nodded and typed in the code to activate the alarm. But nothing happened. The hell. Mummy confusedly uttered as he tried again. Still nothing. What's going on? Why isn't it working? Nine demanded. I don't know. We've been completely locked out of the system. Nothing's responding. Mummy frantically tried to access the main server but he was repeatedly denied by some unknown program that wasn't there before. What do you mean locked us out of the system? We took control of it hours ago, we are the system. Chimera yelled over Mummy's shoulder. Suddenly, all of the monitors went black. Then they came on again but this time they all showed an odd blue symbol behind a white background. Mummy tried his hand at the console again but to no avail. Nine brought up his wrist communicator to notify the rest of his forces but all he got was static. He tapped again but there was still nothing. Slice, Chimera, and Mummy checked their communicators too with the same results. They were completely cut off. Clenching his teeth, Nine whipped his head over to Slice. Go to the ballroom, make sure it's secure, and get one of our soldiers to send a message to the rest of our forces that our perimeter's been beached. On foot, if he has to. Slice ran to the door but was suddenly stopped when Nine yelled, Wait. Nine turned to Mummy. Did you order the security drones to guard the ballroom? What? No. Mummy hesitantly answered. Nine looked befuddled until his eyes widened in realization. Damn it. The leader of the Steel Sabres ran out of the server room with his lieutenants following after him. Running down the halls, they started to hear the sounds of gunfire and panic screaming. They turned the corner and Mummy barely had enough time to dodge out of the way when a security drone flung its cables at his head. Slice and Chimera engaged two more drones attacking them. Slice hacked one apart with her hair while Chimera crushed the other with an enlarged, gorilla-like arm. Mummy threw his bandages at the drone assaulting him, taking control of it, and making it destroy the other one. More screaming was heard coming from the ballroom and Nine ran past his lieutenants, forcing the door open afterward. Blood was the first thing to fly into his face. A drone that was made to capture intruders just decapitated one of his soldiers right in front of him. The sounds of shouting and more gunfire crashed into his ears as he witnessed some of his soldiers as well as Wolfram's hired guns shooting up the attacking drones while partygoers lay flat on the ground, covering their ears while screaming hysterically. Speaking of Wolfram, the man had already dismantled several of the drones and using his magnetism quirk, formed a makeshift arm blade to slice a drone in half while he fired his handgun at the last drone. When it was over, the ballroom was decorated in bullet holes, several eviscerated soldiers, blood, and destroyed drones. Nine, his lieutenants, Wolfram, and the other surviving soldiers caught their breaths as they surveyed the carnage. Daigo, Nobu, and Swordkill suddenly barged into the room after hearing the gunshots and were just as mortified as the others when they saw the state the ballroom was in. Wolfram broke the silence. 
What the fuck just happened? Nine had the same question Wolfram had. His eyes soon drifted over to David Shield. Port of Tokyo Warehouse District. A small army of firefighters, with the help of backdraft, worked as fast as they could to put out the massive flame wall Endeavor had created. After the vigilante stampeded his way through the port and escaped, law enforcement and heroes descended upon the area to contain the damage. Several paramedics also came to the port to treat the unconscious heroes and the wounded since recovery girl was on her way. The wounded would have to make do with regular treatment until she arrived. Eraser head sat in an ambulance while present Mike, Midnight, Loud Cloud, Gran Torino, Ryukyu, Slyden, Go, Miruko, and Hawks crowded around him. Fatgum, Mr. Brave, Gang Orca, Selkie, and Crust were out for the count, being loaded into ambulances by paramedics so they could be taken to the nearest hospital. Endeavor was currently in an argument with a JSDF colonel who was lambasting the flame hero for nearly setting the whole port ablaze. No, no, that had to be a mistake. Your quirk never fails. Maybe you weren't using it right. Present Mike babbled in denial. I'm telling you, I focused as hard as I could on that guy but nothing stopped him from pulling out his weapons. Aizawa responded, sounding defeated. This was going to be a black mark on his career. I, I mean. Loud Cloud started but couldn't find the words. Sighing, he slipped off his goggles and ran a hand through his hair. I've literally got nothing to say, man. That's a first for me. It was the same for everyone. That is until Ryukyu spoke up. What if it's his armor? What if it's shielding him from any known quirk suppressant power? That's possible. Gran Torino mused as he scratched his beard. But for all we know, that suit of his could be giving him his power and there's also the possibility that he could be quirkless if Eraserhead's claims are true, which I believe they are. Not to point out the obvious but I don't think wearing a souped-up armor gives you super strength comparable to All Might and I'm also pretty sure it doesn't give you the ability to whip out massive guns out of nowhere. Hawks jadedly notified, still nursing a broken nose. Yeah, Fatgum and I had the same reaction the first time. Miruko said. The rabid hero had been treated for her burns and bandages were covering up her wounds. Some parts of her hair have been burnt a little though. Are we not going to talk about how he pulled out a freaking railgun? I thought weapons like those only exist in fiction. What kind of technology is he even using? Slide in, go wondered. Redestro would have a field day if he ever got his hands on whatever crazy weaponry that Vigilante was using. The kind that could have blown us to pieces. Present Mike absent mindedly quipped, earning an elbow jab from Eraser Head. Whatever it was, he could have used it to kill any one of us, but he didn't. Midnight stated matter of factly, looking at Ryukyu. That man had every opportunity to kill you, but he never took that option. He never took that option with any of us. Funny, didn't feel that way. The dragon heroine said bitterly as she felt the familiar sting of a busted rib and a missing tooth. We can figure all that out later, we should be talking about what to do now. That lunatic is probably already on I Island right now. Loud Cloud pointed over to the island. There's nothing much we can do. The JSDF still have us on standby, they don't want to endanger the hostages. Eraser Head reminded him. But at this rate, they may have to lift that order. We've already been breached by an unknown party. Half of us are incapacitated and that man is going to get someone killed. Midnight listed, and the severity of the situation made her worried. His motivation does come into question. Gran Torino pondered. What could he possibly be after? Hell if we know. Miruko shrugged. He doesn't look like the saving type dash. You. A familiar voice bellowed. Miruko turned around to see, much to her displeasure, Endeavor stomping towards her. The flame hero had bandages wrapped around his head which were promptly lit aflame when his eyebrows flared up. Oh, dear. Slide and go squeaked as he slowly backed away. The report from the Hero Public Safety Commission stated you met the vigilante the first time. Why didn't you bring him in? He raged as he grabbed Maruko by the scruff of her uniform, the sheer heat radiating off of him threatened to burn her more. 
do you have any notion of the consequences of your blunder? How the fuck was I supposed to know he would kick our asses? Miruko shouted back as she tried to free herself from Endeavor's death grip. And what does it matter to you? You hardly even give a damn about the safety commission, you overblown dickhead. Endeavor raised a fist covered in fire. You insolent, empty-headed trollop I'll dash. In that instant, Endeavor's flames were extinguished and he had a sword made out of feathers pressed closely against his neck. Hawks glared up at him with a deadly look in his eyes. Let. Go. Of. Her. Hawks punctuated dangerously. Endeavor grit his teeth as he looked over to Eraserhead, whose glowing red eyes gave him an intimidating appearance as he used his quirk against him. The other heroes had the same look Aizawa had, ready to stop Endeavor by force if necessary. Conceding defeat, he put Maruko down with a seething grimace. Hey! Hey! They all heard someone yell. It was from a police officer running over to them who was already short of breath. The sabers just hijacked the airwaves. They're broadcasting on every station. He yelled as he headed over back to the blockade near the entrance of the port. The heroes followed the officer back to the barricade where more police officers, JSDF soldiers, emergency crews, other heroes, and reporters were crowded around a broadcast truck. They were all staring at an array of screens inside the truck, showing the dreaded mercenaries themselves. Three sabers stood alongside each other. The one in the center had his arms folded while the other two beside them held their P90S. They were all standing in a dimly lit control room of some kind with an office door behind them, the tiny window showed a saber standing guard with his back turned. Citizens of Tokyo, we are the Steel Sabers, and we are in complete control. I Island Central Tower Ballroom. All might tensed up at the broadcast. The sabers were now beginning to strike fear and doubt into the public. Reminded that he was again powerless to do anything, All Might struggled against his bindings in another vain attempt to escape. He stopped resisting when he realized that it would only hasten the decline of one for all. Looking over towards Nine, he watched the commander of the Sabres order his surviving soldiers to head to different parts of the island and tell the other soldiers to destroy the drones and seek out a possible infiltrator. As they left, All Might turned his gaze over to the dead bodies and destroyed drones. Why did the drones kill them? These were only programmed to capture and subdue any intruders. Why did they suddenly start butchering them? Musuda Furikido Sato residents. Coincidentally, the boys of Class 1A who weren't able to go to I Island with their friends opted to have themselves a little hang out at one of their houses much like Tsuyu, Mina, and Heigakure. It was a standard get-together, pizza, video games, movies, swap stories, and the like. That is until they heard that I Island had been taken over by terrorists and the whole day went from elation to worry. Rikido, Yuga, Siro, Mizo, Koji, Ojiro, and Tokoyami sat in the living room watching the news. They were glued to their seats ever since the announcement. It was a nail-biting ordeal having to hear that their friends were stuck on an island with the most dangerous mercenaries in the world. As they worried for their friends' lives, they were thrown in for another ringer when they heard that the same vigilante who ripped off Tamura's arm at the mall had plowed his way through several pro heroes to get to the island. The mere mention of the vigilante was enough to send shivers down their spines, remembering how utterly brutal the man was. Then came the hijacked airwaves showing the steel sabers themselves boasting their superiority. The boys could only watch, helpless and angry that there wasn't anything to be done. But that's when they noticed the one saber guarding the door outside in view of the window suddenly get dragged away out of sight. Ciro blinked. Wait, what just happened to that guy? For a few seconds, there was nothing until a splash of blood covered the window. The teens jumped back in shock. The door was slowly opened and their jaws dropped when they saw who it was. Mondu. Hugo exclaimed. That's. I Island Central Tower Ballroom. That's him. Jiro whispered fearfully to her huddled classmates. Momo, Denki, Mineta, and Ida let out silent gasps when they watched the vigilante himself enter the room, his hands soaked in blood. Nine and Wolfram, along with their followers, noticed him enter the room without drawing the attention of the three sabers. Wolfram carefully studied the vigilante, 
He remembered hearing from Kurogiri that this was the one who tore off Shigaraki's arm. The Nomu explained to Wolfram that once they were done with Eye Island, all for one would turn his attention to what must be done about the interloper. But what he wanted to know was how the hell did he slip past the sabers. They were supposed to be the best of the best. Omega Squad 1. There's an intruder in the subpen. He's right behind you. Omega Squad 1. Come in. Nine shouted into his communicator. But there was still nothing but static and the commander angrily ripped the communicator off his arm and threw it to the ground. I Island Factory District Subpan. The Doomslayer silently stared at the sabers who had their backs turned to him. The sergeant in the middle was yammering their demands to a camera in front of them, it was most likely broadcasting this. But none of it mattered to the slayer who kept his eyes focused on the one in the middle and decided that Motormouth would go first. He reached into his hammer space backpack. I Island Central Tower Third Floor. What the fuck? Bakugu loudly cussed as he watched the vigilante pull out a blood-covered chainsaw much to everyone's horror. Midoriya's pupils dilated when he saw the vigilante's hand grip the ripcord. No. 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 I Island Factory District. The Slayer's grip tightened on the cord as he glared at the yammering saber, his hatred for the organization growing. These bastards murdered innocent heroes, desecrated their bodies, profiteered off their deaths. He was going to send them all back to hell where they belong. Ozzy Osbourne straight to hell, starts at 1.10. The Doomslayer revved up his chainsaw and the sergeant spun around just in time to see him bring his saw down upon him. Aawaga. The Doomslayer sawed the saber straight down the middle in a torrent of blood. He swung the saw at the panicking saber on the left, decapitating him in an instant, and turning to the other one on the right who was now screaming and firing at him with his weapon. He ran the saber through with his saw, hefted the body over his head with the still-spinning blade ripping into the murk, and threw him at the camera. The dead saber was sent hurling through the observation deck window along with the camera, the hollowed-out falling to the ground. The camera just so happened to land on top of a crate, showing an entire subpan full of steel sabers dropping what they were doing and arming themselves with their weapons just as the slayer jumped down into view. He swapped out his chainsaw for the chain gun outfitted with the mobile turret mod, by far his personal favorite. At this point, the sabers had already opened fire upon him with their weapons and were only just noticing that nothing was penetrating the intruder's armor, and he had just pulled out a minigun that unfurled into three barrels. The chain gun's gunfire alone was loud enough to drown out the gunfire from the sabers, as well as their shouting. The chain gun spewed out a torrent of 15mm tungsten slugs from its triple barrel so fast and so loud that it could have been mistaken for an A-10 warthog. The doomslayer swept the weapon from side to side against the small army of sabers, many ended up getting perforated into Swiss cheese, reduced to mulch, or outright cut in half. Some tried to hide behind the crates for cover but the chain gun tore straight through the containers and any mercenary stupid enough to hide behind them. 125. The rounds also hit several fuel drums scattered around the submarine, detonating them in a fiery explosion that blew the sabers to pieces or lit them aflame. Putting away the chain gun, the slayer jumped on top of the crates and then double jumped up to the walkway above where more sabers were attacking him. He whipped out his super shotgun and blew the first merc in half, reloading instantly and obliterating another one with a simple pull off the trigger. He continued to run along the walkway and blew away any saber with his double-barreled death dealer. Bodies fell off the walkway and plummeted into the rapidly growing fire below. He put away his shotgun and began to punch his way through their ranks in a relentless fury. He punched the jaw off one merc and followed up by smashing the skull of another into a wall. He tore one in half and threw the torso at a hapless merc. Falling to the ground, he tried to push the body off of him but the Doomslayer swiftly brought his foot down upon his skull like he was crushing a watermelon. He drew the rocket launcher equipped with the remote detonation mod and fired a rocket and the other end of the walkway, blowing up the remaining sabers and scattering their body parts like a macabre fireworks display. Two large groups of sabers who heard the commotion from outside of the subpen swarmed in like an army of ants into the subbay and fired at the Slayer above. He double jumped off the walkway and fired two rockets at the largest group on the left, detonating them in mid flight when they tried to run. If the initial explosions didn't kill them, then the bursts of razor sharp shrapnel certainly did the job, 
filling the air with the pained screams of the sabers as they profusely bled from the shards digging into their bodies and eyes. Landing atop the sub, the Doomslayer put away the rocket launcher and drew his plasma gun. He unleashed a stream of plasma at the sabers on the other side, killing a few of them as the others quickly began to disperse. He chucked one of his grenades at the fleeing mercs who were reduced to a red mist. Seeing another group of sabers bunch up and noticing that he had acquired a full charge for the heat blast, the slayer jumped down into the center of the group and pulled the trigger. The sheer heat from the blast radius liquefied the sabers instantaneously, their uniforms and melting flesh sloughing off their bones. One remaining saber that managed to escape the radius kept firing at the slayer in sheer terror but he was already upon the soldier, plunging his fist into his chest and ripping out his spinal cord along with his head straight out of his body. He then threw the head at the camera, destroying it and cutting off the transmission. Turning his attention towards the submarine, the slayer wasted no time jumping back up onto the sub and pulling out his sledgehammer. He ripped off the hatch door and jumped down into the sub, crushing an unlucky saber underneath him like he was a blood-filled soda can. Still clutching the sledgehammer and hatch door in his hands, he glared at the sabers already mobilizing down the sub's hallway. He was certainly going to enjoy this next part. Skip to 254. He rushed towards the mercs as they fired at him, the bullets harmlessly shattering against his armor. He didn't even bother to use the hatch door for a shield, opting to use it as a bludgeon instead. He crushed the first merc's head with a single swing, followed up by smashing his sledgehammer downward onto the skull of another. More sabers started pouring into the hallway and they met the same fate, some had their bones fatally broken when the slayer slammed his shield against them while others had their internal organs pulverized by his sledgehammer, leaving a mess of broken bodies in his wake. The doom slayer threw his shield like a frisbee at the sabers, slicing several of them in half before embedding itself into the wall. He gripped the sledgehammer with both hands and went full on Argenta on them, destroying their heads and smashing them into the ground and sometimes even the ceiling, leaving the floor sticky with their blood. The final swing of his sledgehammer broke the spine of the last saber as well as the head of the hammer as well. Shame. He was starting to like it. The slayer tossed away the broken sledgehammer and retrieved the hatch door from the wall. He raced down the hall until he turned left down another hallway that led to the navigation room. Two armed sabers emerged from the room and the slayer flung the door at the pair, one of them having just enough time to dodge out of the way while the one behind him was reduced to a red smear when the shield went straight through the poor fucker and impaled itself into another saber in the room. The surviving saber tried to raise his weapon when the slayer rushed him and the berserker grabbed him and threw him towards the open door to the navigation room. Due to the door's small frame, the merc's head and legs were sheared off like they were in a meat slicer. The slayer barged into the navigation room filled with panicking sabers who were all armed. One tried to shoot him at point black with a USAS, 12 but the slayer ripped it out of his hands, along with his arms, and ran him straight through the chest. One saber was hiding behind the open door to the navigation room and the slayer slammed his foot shut on him, splattering the soldier's body like a fly on a windshield. The sabers were starting to panic for the first time in their careers and it wasn't hard to see why, they only fought heroes, not a barbarian. A saber who was brave enough to rush him unloaded his MG4 at the slayer but he grabbed the weapon and guided it across the room, nailing all of the soldiers while the merc was stupid enough to keep depressing the trigger. The doom slayer grabbed him by the cranium and smashed him to into the periscope, the head bursting apart like a balloon. He pulled out his combat shotgun and exited through the door at the far end, blowing away any soldier unfortunate enough to be in his way. He raced through the tight hallways while his charged burst mod made quick of them. The Doomslayer continued to run through the hallways down to the core, blasting his way through his enemies and filling the metal halls with the sounds of shotgun blasts and clattering shell casings. He blasted the head off another saber before he finally found the room containing the submarine's nuclear core. It was a massive cylindrical device with a multitude of pipes funneled into it along with pumps attached along the base. Slash to detonate the core, you must destroy the coolant pumps. The resulting buildup of pressure will overheat the fuel rods and render them unable to circulate the trapped seawater until the core goes critical. I am turning off the security checks to shut off the reactor now. The blast radius should be low yield and will only affect the factory district of Eye Island. You will easily survive the explosion and your suit will absorb any radiation dispersed as well as the resulting EMP. 
be aware that while I Island has an array of emergency generators, the security drones will be permanently disabled. I can still hack the security systems but the drones will be inoperable, forward slash. Fine with him. The Slayer began to rip apart the coolant pumps with his bare hands, the steel easily torn apart like cheap cardboard. As he continued to destroy the pumps, alarms began to blare and emergency lights bathed the room in red. The fuel rods inside the core began to melt and were immediately going critical with the temperature inside the room reaching unbearable levels. As the Doomslayer destroyed the last of the pumps and saw the reactor expanding, he got out his Gauss cannon and charged up the Siege Mode mod, bracing himself for the explosion as he began to depress the trigger. Didn't this remind him of something? If stopping our energy production is what you want then you only need to destroy this last filter and Argent Energy will no longer exist in this solar system, we will be back at square one. Oh yeah, good times. A fireman had just put out another pool of flames near the port with his hose when he noticed a bright flash out of the corner of his eye. He turned his head over to Eye Island and his entire world went white when an utterly gigantic ball of fire erupted from the island and sent him, his other firefighters along with several heroes landing flat on their asses and nearly deafening them. The explosion could be seen from far away on the mainland and was loud enough to shatter every manner of glass on the shoreline and causing thousands upon thousands of Japanese citizens to cry out in panic. Miruko was nearly blinded when the rippling explosion came from Eye Island and was forced to cover her ears from the volume due to her sensitive hearing. On Eye Island, any sabers inside the industrial district were swallowed up in the explosion that consumed the entire area, bathing it in fire, more explosions, and casting an orange glow across the island. Every single window was shattered and the force of the blast shook the island like it was hit by an earthquake. Izuku and his friends nearly had their eardrums blown out as the window exploded into glass and parts of the ceiling fell on top of them. The chandelier hanging in the ballroom fell from the rafters, causing everyone to scramble out of the way as it hit. Sabres near the industrial district were thrown off their feet and the security drones fell over when the EMP fried their internal circuits. In short, it was like a bomb hit Eye Island. And all of the radioactivity that was invisible to the naked eye was being funneled back into the ruined industrial district via unknown means. Back at the port of Tokyo, everyone was treated to the sight of a fucking mushroom cloud coming from Eye Island. Tony Pope and his cameraman stared on with their jaws hanging open. Holy God, tell me you got that. You betcha. Eye Island Service Bridge. Doom 2016 Intro. The sabers dotted around the island were quick to recover from the explosion and squads from all over the island rushed to the factory district as fast as they could but the EMP disabled their radios. Luckily, their APC and tanks were shielded with insulated armor that protected them from anything that could disable them, shame they couldn't do that for their radios. Several squads and APCs were now converged at the service bridge that led to the industrial district. The Steel Sabres felt their morale crumble when they realized that the submarine was most likely taken out along with most of their forces. Then, they heard something. It was a low thumping sound that was coming from the other end of the bridge. The mercenaries immediately took their positions, aiming their weapons toward the bridge. The gunners loaded up the turrets on the APCs. Snipers armed with DSR-50s aimed through their scopes. The sound was getting louder. It almost sounded like they were footsteps. The sabers were beginning to sweat as their grips on their weaponry tightened. The sound was slow, methodical, and maddening. From afar, they could see a shape through the sea of flames coming towards the bridge. It was hard to make out but as it drew nearer, it turned out to be the figure of a man. And he finally stepped forth from the fire. The unchained predator, completely unfazed and untouched from the blast, plodded towards the sabers with his super shotgun clutched firmly in his grasp. All squads focus fire on the hostile. I repeat, focus fire on the hostile. As the bullets did absolutely nothing to his Preter suit, the slayer popped open the breech of his super shotgun and loaded in two shells. Rip. And. Tear. To be continued. Chapter 12. The Destroyer. Part 1. Musuta for scenic overlook. Normally when people or tourists came to this little spot in the Japanese countryside, it was mostly to enjoy the view and bask in the lush forests of Japan. Now it was mostly deserted, save for Yuzhil and Uriel who stood alone near the edge as he observed Eye Island far away out in the distance. 
They could see the mushroom cloud beginning to dissipate while down below the cityscape, emergency vehicles screamed down the highways. Their ears began to pick up the sounds of gunfire coming from the island. The Doomslayer's retribution upon the steel sabers had begun. Usual and Uriel could only imagine what was going on over there. The sheer, unspeakable brutality being carried out on that island would scar the world forever. As much as the Archangels wanted to intervene, they knew that it was not their place to interfere in the realm of mortals. They were bound by law to observe and could only directly take action if they were granted permission. Uriel swallowed fearfully. Usual placed a comforting hand on her shoulder. It is okay to be frightened, sister. Usual assured her. I know. Uriel lowered her head. But his presence has the entirety of the Ascendant Realm questioning what must be done, even the Prime Council is at a loss. He is, after all, the prop he's eyes destroyer. Do not forget, Uriel. The Helix Stone described him as the destroyer of evil. Not the innocent. Usual reminded her. He went out of his way to save those schoolchildren and their teacher, he did not harm those UA students and did not kill any of those heroes who tried to stop him. I am fully confident that the Doomslayer will rescue the hostages and All Might. He is not our enemy. Uriel cupped her chin in thought, eventually concluding that her brother had a very valid point. If that is the case, then I pray that their lives will be safe in his hands. They heard another explosion come from Eye Island and the gunfire began to increase in intensity. They felt a chill when they sensed the Hellwalkers' rage from where they stood. The Archangels could only hope that the Sabres' deaths were quick and painless. Eye Island. Sonic Mayhem descent into CERB Aaron. Ayaha Ayaha. The Sabres' torso was sent sailing over his panicking comrades when the Slayer blew him in half with his super shotgun. Swapping his favorite weapon out for the HAR, he began racking up headshot after headshot as the 50 caliber bullets tore through the skulls of the attacking sabers. He then followed up by unleashing a barrage of missiles at the remaining mercs who were messily blown apart. Another squad of sabers rounded the corner of a building to witness an utterly grisly sight, a lone man in green armor standing amongst a literal sea of blood and dismembered bodies with several APCs reduced to burning scrap behind him. Tango primary spotted. Light the fucker up. Bolting towards the squad as the bullets shattered against his plating, the Slayer drew his super shotgun again and blasted through them while grabbing one of them by the neck and tearing out his jugular. He put away his weapon and threw a fist that went straight through the face of a saber, grabbed his assault rifle, and gunned down several of his squad mates. He launched himself at the sergeant and slammed his foot down on his ankle, breaking it before grabbing him by the sides of his head and tearing it right off his shoulders. Oh god no 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 fucking dash. The terrified saber who uselessly fired his pistol at him was promptly silenced when the slayer brought a downward chop upon his skull, splitting his head vertically in half. The sounds of a 30mm gun spitting hot lead at him turned his attention to an APC and several squads of steel sabers on each side of it were charging toward him down the road ahead. Running towards the small army without a hint of fear as they fired what amounted to several thousand bullets and shells at him, the doomslayer brought out the combat shotgun and attached the explosive shot mod. He launched a grenade into the nearest group, hopped up on top of the APC as chunks rained down on him, and bent the barrel of the turret. He tore off the hatch and launched another grenade into the interior of the APC, the explosion catapulting the Slayer into the air and taking out several more sabers. He pivoted himself around in midair and began blasting the surviving sabers with his shotgun as he fell downwards. Landing onto the skull of a soldier and reducing it to paste, the Doomslayer unloaded more shells into the sabers and finished the last one off by throwing a combat knife into his throat. The emergency generators came online at this moment and all of the lampposts as well as the lights inside every building on the island flickered back on. Looking up at one of the now activated security cameras near a signpost and figuring that Nine was probably watching this, the Doomslayer went over to a dead saber and ripped off his head. He held up the severed head in front of the camera, following up by crushing it in his grasp and sending blood and brain spilling onto the street. He glared at the camera threateningly, giving Nine a clear message, he was coming for him. His HUD showed him the map of the island, showing thousands of red blips nearing his position as well as displaying how many sabers were left on Eye Island. 5,261 of them remain. Time to get to work. 
Bringing out the chain gun, he swapped out the mobile turret mod for the seldom used Gatling rotator mod. It may not have the destructive capability as its predecessor but the incendiary ammo was a nice touch. Running down the street, he made a sharp left and kept heading straight until he heard the telltale sounds of running footsteps and APC engines. He spun up the barrel just as he emerged from the street corner to come face to face against a small army of sabers and several APCs. Since the barrel of the chain gun was already spinning up, the slayer depressed the trigger and the first few sabers in front of him were shredded apart. But it didn't stop there, the bullets continued drilling straight through the ones behind them. The superheated rounds tore through the crowd, the slightest grays lighting them on fire and detonating the grenades around their belts. The tungsten bullets perforated the APCs and ignited the fuel inside them, creating more explosions amongst the army. Screams filled the air as the sabers were cut to ribbons, blown to pieces, and lit aflame in a domino effect of destruction. The slayer walked forward as his chain gun spewed white hot death at the army before him as blood flowed across the concrete like a stream. Once the last of them were gunned down, the slayer heard several APCs approaching from behind and fast. Dispensing his chain gun into his hammer space backpack, he turned around and charged toward the APCs. There were eight of them in total barreling down the street and firing their coaxial turrets at him. The 30mm rounds that were being fired out of the barrels were capable of destroying a fortified bunker, tearing apart a lightly armored vehicle, and vaporizing live targets. So it pretty much came to a jaw-dropping shock when the main gunners inside the APC saw that the 30mm rounds were bouncing off the Tango primary's armor like fucking golf balls. The Doomslayer could feel the fist-sized bullets impact his armor but not stagger him in the slightest. It wasn't surprising given his first fight against the sabers in his hideout, if the hell-forged plating of his Praetor suit could protect him from hell energy and demons alike then it had no problem repelling modern firearms. He closed the distance and jumped on top of the first APC and tore off the tow launcher next to the turret. The sabers inside the APC began to flip out. He tore off the tow. He tore off the fucking tow dash. The Doomslayer aimed down at the APC and pulled the trigger to fire a missile point plank at the vehicle which exploded into a ball of fire. He leaped off the wreckage and landed atop the second APC, bringing out his rocket launcher and switching to the lock-on burst mod. He locked onto the other three APCs and launched the rockets at them before double-jumping off the APC he was on and firing another rocket at it. The force of the explosion propelled him up into the air just as the APCs beneath him exploded and he locked onto three more vehicles as they fired up at him. He pulled the trigger to deliver his destructive ordnance again and fell downwards towards the last remaining APC just as the others were enveloped in massive explosions. Balling up both of his fists, the Slayer slammed down upon the APC and crushed it with the force of a falling wrecking ball. The APC seemingly folded in on itself due to the extreme force and the occupants inside were instantly killed. His HUD began to pick up three very large groups of hostiles approaching his position from the three-way intersection he was in. Looking down at the ruined APC beneath him, the Doomslayer easily tore off the coaxial turret and wielded it like a giant warhammer. The first group of sabers easily numbering close to a thousand arrived on the scene just in time to see the Tango primary charge towards them while carrying a ruined APC turret in his hands. What the fuck? Is that dash? Open fire. Kill that motherfucker. What happened next could only be described as an utter bloodbath. The Doomslayer swung his makeshift weapon downward at the sabers and splattered them like they were flies. He charged at the Merxen while swinging his club to and fro so hard that most of them exploded into viscera from the force and weight of the weapon. Sabers were sent flying with a majority of their bones reduced to paste and slammed into buildings or through windows in broken, crumpled up heaps. The Doomslayer continued to crush the opposition in a frenzied fury, each soldier exploding like a balloon from every swing of his club. The gore began to splash over his Praetor suit, literally painting him with the blood of his enemies and further demoralizing the sabers who wildly fired their weapons at him. The slayer began to spin around like a top with his club in hand, utterly destroying the sabers and sending them hurtling into walls where they splattered against them and staining the buildings red. He finally threw the ruined turret into the crowd, shredding apart most of them in its flight path before slamming into a building while pancaking more unlucky mercs against it. He pulled out his chainsaw and leaped into the fray with all of the rage-filled zeal he had during his fight against the demons in hell. 
he became a walking storm of hate and rancor, he ripped and tore his way through the crowd with his saw as their bullets ricocheted off their armor and back into them. Time seemed to blur for the slayer as he sliced several heads off in one swing. It was one of those rare moments during the eons in the Dark Realm where he entered a berserker state without the use of a berserk sphere. He put away his chainsaw and grabbed a saber by the sides of his head, tore him straight down the middle followed up by shoving his fist through the chest of another saber before back fisting the head off the one next to him. He then dove into the middle of the army and began ripping off their heads and limbs while punching through their bodies and sending most of their blood and entrails splattering across the ground. Time lost all meaning to the Doomslayer and he tore through the mercenaries. All he could hear were screaming, bones breaking, flesh tearing, gunfire, men barking orders and blood spilling across the ground. After what seemed like mere minutes to him, the Slayer finally snapped out of his haze and could only see red in his vision. Wiping off the blood covering his helmet visor, he found himself standing atop a small hill of eviscerated corpses with an ankle-deep lake of blood around it with more dead bodies floating amongst the remains and fires dotted all over the place. The first of the two large groups arrived at the scene and stopped dead in their tracks. Many of them were shaking with fright or outright vomiting inside their masks. They never took their eyes off the armored intruder who was quite literally drenched in blood and standing atop a hill of their comrades, all of them dismembered and butchered beyond recognition. It was like they were looking at a vision of hell. A fate that awaited all of them for murdering innocent heroes for years. Hold fast, it's only one hostile. All squads engage. In gag dash. The slayer instantly spun around while pulling out his gauss cannon and fired at the sergeant. He was instantly railed into oblivion along with dozens of sabers unlucky enough to be behind him. He jumped off the bodies and quickly exchanged his siege mode mod with the precision bolt mod as the sabers opened fire. The doomslayer began scoring multiple headshots, each kill detonating the body of the dispatched merc in a volatile discharge that took out anyone near the blast radius. Due to the sabers being so densely packed against one another, the precision bolt blasts were rapidly thinning them out and covering them in the steaming blood of their vaporized squad mates. The sabers at this point were now completely demoralized and began to flee for their lives. The slayer followed after them while launching more ionized fleshettes at them before putting it away and turning to the third squad coming at him from the opposite street. He pulled out the chain gun and HAR, dual wielding them with ease and unleashing a hailstorm of incendiary tungsten rounds, 50 caliber bullets, and missiles at the army before him while slowly marching towards them with his fingers on the triggers. The sabers in the front barely had time to bring up their weapon as they were mulched into a red paste along with the others behind them. More and more of the mercs were killed in droves until the ones in the back that hadn't been killed started to run for their lives as fast as they could. Fall back. Fall back to the central tower, now. The doomslayer stopped firing and watched the sabers run away in the other direction, leaving their dead or dying squad mates behind. His HUD began to show the sabers in the central quadrant of Eye Island retreating to the central tower or staying near the vicinity of the tower, most likely fortifying their positions. He was almost going to head right on over to the central tower and take them out along with Nine but then he noticed there were still more sabers located on the right quadrant of the island which hosted their expo events. The Doomslayer stood still, deep in thought. He could attack the central tower now but that would still leave potential reinforcements holding him up if they ever grew brave enough to stop him. That and if the heroes ever decided to storm the island then they would end up in the saber's crosshairs. Not wanting to have any more heroes die at their hands, the slayer drew his super shotgun and made a break for the right quadrant of Eye Island. The slayer mentally remarked to himself how easy this was as he ran through the Gorsok streets. Eons of fighting in hell had rendered any non-demonic opposition virtually powerless against him. It made the Doomslayer feel oddly comfortable, figuring he needed a break from fighting demons for so long. But then there were the superpowered beings of this world. He hoped he wouldn't have to fight them. Not that he couldn't easily beat them but rather because they were genuinely helping or saving innocent people. He didn't want to be lumped together with these hero killers. Speaking of which. 3724 remaining. Kobe Hyogo Prefecture. Within an abandoned factory, the sounds of a television set could be heard within the hollowed-out assembly line. Up in the empty office area, a woman was seated at one of the remaining desks watching the TV. 
She was intently observing the news report as she plucked out strands of her blue and pink two-tone hair and molded them into bullets like they were made of clay. She never took her eyes off the TV as she loaded her specialized ammunition into her arm, which opened itself up into a magazine-like compartment made of muscle and bone. An obnoxious American reporter was losing his shit right in front of the camera as police, military, and heroes were running around all over the place. The footage switched to the speck of Eye Island out in the distance, thin trails of smoke coming from it along with the occasional popping of gunfire. Changing the channel, the woman watched another news report that showed a playback of the vigilante who plowed his way through the port and put several pro-heroes in the hospital. The man, shockingly enough, was powerful enough to one-shot the flame hero himself. Couldn't have happened to a nicer douchebag. She switched off the TV, flipped open her laptop, and scrolled through the internet until she came upon pictures of the vigilante on social media. She eventually found a particular picture of him tearing off the arm of Tamira Shigaraki, confirmed by some sources to be the leader of the League of Villains. She zoomed in on the vigilante and leaned in closer to the screen. Taking on the LOV was quite an accomplishment but waging war against the most feared mercenaries in the world. This guy had to be tougher than tungsten and meaner than hell. A man after my own heart. Lady Nagin smiled as she brushed aside her locks of hair. Hope you live through this. To be continued.